have you ever met a person perhaps somebody you know well perhaps somebody you work with that acts like the Bible is poison I mean how could God's Word be like a gallon of cleaner I mean this this stuff has so many warnings written on here it, it, it says caution if you if you swallow this contact poison control if you breathe enough of it go outside and get fresh air to get the vapors out of your lungs it's a very very serious thing if if it comes in contact with your skin begin immediately washing with water it says if it gets in your eyes rinse with water for a long period of time and call poison control because the substances if they come in contact with you, they're poisonous. Literally, the very products we buy to brighten our homes, to clean our, our churches and our workplaces, if we come in contact with them the wrong way, they harm us. This could explain why when we take the blessed word of God, the world reacts the way they do. Now, as we look at life transformations, this thought that we're going to explore today is huge. It's the third one. And we're going to go through it for a few minutes together as we, as we talk about this. Without the third one, it's a no-go. Your car, if the battery's dead, it won't start. It doesn't matter how much fuel you have. If the battery's dead, it won't start. Because if the battery's dead, you get no crank. And with no crank, you get no option to start your motor. So in order to start your car, you have to have crank. The fuel has to come in when it's cranking and the spark has to spark to light that fuel on fire and then boom, your car is running. So those are the three that go from no-go of a dead shut off car to you rolling down the street headed wherever you're headed. But when one is missing, it dies out, nothing happens. We've looked at the first big life transformation. Everything changed in my life when Jesus Christ became my personal Lord and Savior. I who was dead in my sin was made alive through Him. I who was condemned am now covered. I who had no way was lifted up to God through my mediator Jesus Christ. Being born again changes everything, and yet few there be that find it. Then we talk about after we're born again, but grow in grace and in the knowledge. And the second major life transformation kicks in when you enter the rare arena number two of the born again person who decides to work and develop a thorough working knowledge of the Word of God. Literally, there's a Bible verse for everything. All wisdom, all knowledge, all power, all understanding belongs to God. He has released it to us in His Word. And yet so many people fail at life transformation number two, and that is to get a thorough working knowledge of the Word of God. And so we get to the point 
where we have our salvation. We know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Thank God for the miracle moment when I was saved. And then we move forward and we grow in grace and the knowledge and the understanding. And we learn the Word of God. And we have that thorough knowledge. But today we're asking a very weird question talking about toxic things and talking about the blessed Bible that we love. Now, we know in our hearts that we love the blessed old book, but how does it become poison? What makes it toxic and how we overcome that is what we're looking at today. Join me in the Word. In our scriptures, the first one we'll read is Proverbs 25 and verse 11. Listen to the wisdom of God. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. Our second passage from the New Testament comes from Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 and verse number 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. In John 14, Jesus said in verse 26 and 27, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, what I've commanded you. You know, as we talk about the life transformations, we know what hasn't transformed our life. We know that no amount of money has ever really been transformative. For even the wealthiest billionaires of all have said just a little bit more. We know that no relationship no person loving us, no securing that one has really transformed our life. We know that no recognition, no matter how high up the ladder you go, no matter how big your circle of praise, it leaves you empty at the end. We know the transformations of life are in the spirit and then they live out in our day-to-day -day life. And the first transformation is being born again. The second transformation is a thorough working knowledge of the Word of God. Most people are living their life who are born again, scattered, broken, and like the Bible says of the enemy, he takes them captive whenever he feels like it at his evil will because they don't have the whole armor of God. They don't have the Word of God hidden in their heart. They don't have the truths of God. The, the thorough working knowledge of the Word of God isn't there. But today, we move into the third transformation, and this is where everything starts to change. And that is a Holy Spirit-guided application of the knowledge the Word of God gives us. You see, if your life is really going to be transformed, you must be born again, you must know the Word of God, then you must walk in the Spirit, have the Holy Spirit guide you in the application of that knowledge. Now, let's look at a couple of instances where the Bible is of no effect or becomes toxic and then we'll talk about how to overcome that. The first instance where you take the Word of God and it becomes poison, it's toxic, it, it doesn't create the good effect God intended for it to create is when it's not mixed with faith. Listen to the words of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. 
For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You see, they didn't have faith when they heard the word of God, so there was no profit. Now, Proverbs says in 17 and verse 16, Wherefore is the price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he has no heart for it? In other words, the fool has no heart to attain the wisdom, so he offers nothing for it. The Bible says that it was preached and there was no profit because they didn't have faith. You see, faith is what activates the Bible. The truth lies dormant until it is mixed without faith. That's why the scripture tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why? Because he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, faith is belief, belief enough to take action, knowing and doing. I believe the word of God because I receive it in faith. In other words, I'm taking it as true, and so I'm believing, and that moves into faith or taking action. Faith is trust enough to do what it says. Sometimes when we're following our GPS, we go, this direction doesn't make sense. I'm supposed to be headed that way, and it's telling me to go this way. I know where I want to go is that way. This is telling me to go this way. I don't have faith when I start to question and not follow because I'm seeing something else. When we don't have faith in the Word of God, it loses its effect because we're no longer acting on the Word of God. That's why James said, you say you have faith, but you're not doing the actions. That means no faith is really there. We must believe the Word of God. Now, I really doubt that there's a lot of people watching this video who wouldn't say, I believe the Word of God. When the gospel was preached unto me, I received the gospel of salvation. I know what the Word of God says. And so this dangerous mixture is not very prevalent in my life. But friend, it is prevalent in a lot of places. And so it's important that we understand without the additive of faith, according to Hebrews 4.2, the Word of God is just a byproduct. The Word preached didn't do anything for them because they didn't have faith when they heard it. Jesus said it this way, Your eyes have your clo closed, your ears have you stopped, lest you should hear with your ears, see with your eyes, and receive the truth and I would convert you, I would transform you. They could have had all the miracles of Jesus released over their life, but instead they sat there what? As I said, the way Solomon described it in Proverbs 17, the fool offers nothing to wisdom, he has no heart for it. So all the wisdom of God was there, it was of none effect because they didn't have faith. So the Bible, is totally benign or non-functioning. It's almost a poison to those who don't mix faith in with the Word of God to act on what the Word of God shows them to do. Now, I want to show you the second instance where the Bible can be very toxic. The second avenue where the Bible becomes a poison toxin is really what I will call an acidic activation. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5 and verse 6, listen to the words of the Scripture. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, 
who has made us ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter kills. Toxic. But the Spirit gives life. I'm afraid that many years of my own life were parked in this arena. From a child, I knew the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make me wise unto salvation. Thank you, Lord God, and thank you to the faithful people in my family and in my church who brought the hearing of the Word of God to my ears because faith came by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and I was born again as a young man. Thank you to those who introduced me and taught me and influenced me to faithfully study the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Be a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. You're not ignorant. Rightly dividing the word of truth. But you know, it says there, the letter killeth. It's acidic. It's a toxin. It's a poison. It's harmful. You know, I'm afraid that right here is the dwelling place of many very serious children of God. Oh, you're frustrated that others who won't be born again don't receive Jesus as their Savior. We all are. We want to see people turn to Jesus Christ. You're frustrated that the people you know who already know Jesus as their Savior are not growing in the Word of God. They're not developing a thorough working knowledge of the Word of God. But somehow, while wanting to influence and help people, the opposite is happening. We all know somebody, maybe a family member, a friend. I, I wonder if you could think of one right now who you would say has the green thumb. Yeah. Everything they touch just flourishes. You have a house plant, it's dying. You give it to them a week later, staunch and healthy. What'd you do? Oh, they just have the green thumb, the magic touch. We cannot go forward and fulfill the Great Commission when everything we touch dies. When we're toxic, and we're killing everything, we're not bringing the life of Jesus to anything. And a lot of people, serious good people, I mean those who are ministers of the gospel, those who fill the halls of our Bible colleges, those who sign up and choose the sacrificial life of being a Christian worker. I mean the Christian school teacher, the church secretaries, the workers, the laborers in the field for God. Many of them are living in the toxic zone. A lot of leaders in churches and longtime members and teachers and others are in the harmful zone because they're falling exactly into what 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5 and 6 warn us about, that the letter, all of our understanding of the letter, is just killing everything. So we look at the secret sauce of a successful Christian life. Oh, we must be born again to be one of Christ, to be a Christian. We must understand the Bible. The entrance of God's Word gives light. We now know what to do. But then we somehow move into the toxic zone where the Bible is poisonous and we find people around us reacting to the Bible like it's poisonous. 
Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a brother or sister. Maybe it's a former church member friend who now wants nothing to do with anything. And we begin to doubt and question what happened to this person? What, what happened on this journey? How did it go wrong for them? It's because we got part one right and we were born again. And we got part two right and we developed a thorough working knowledge of the Word of God. But we missed the third leg of the stool so everything fell down. And it's summed up so beautifully in 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1 through verse number 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Catch what's happening in verse 1 through verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Thank God for believers who speak. Too many are silent. He says, I'm speaking. And then in verse 2, he says, I have all knowledge. I have a thorough working knowledge of the word of God. And then it shows in verse 3, I put that to action. I go forward in a life of sacrifice. How many of God's servants are sacrificing today? Hey, your, your labor of love is not lost on the Lord. But there's a lot of people who are speaking and they have the knowledge and they are sacrificing their life away. And they wonder, how is everything around them not happening? Why isn't it flourishing? Why is everything dying? Though I have not charity. Now, some people take 1 Corinthians 13 and they, they polish it off and they, they push it aside. Oh, that's a love verse. That's a romance chapter. No, though I have charity, charity is unselfish love. See, Paul would say, walk in the Spirit. Live a life of unselfish love. Unselfish love is what takes your speaking and gives it a voice. Unselfish love is what takes your knowledge and makes it receptive to the hearer. Unselfish love is what makes your sacrifices begin to pay off in the fruit you're producing in other people's lives. When we have that charity, that unselfish love, that Holy Spirit guided application of the knowledge that we have from the Word of God. Because knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You see, Jesus to the thief on the cross hanging next to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus in his hour of greatest suffering Charity, unselfish love, I'll save to the uttermost him that cometh to me. Jesus on the cross, unselfish love, looking at the apostle, looking at his mother, and passing over the care of his mother to the apostle from himself. Unselfish love, and oh, the impact that brings. They brought a woman into the midst by Jesus because they were condemning her. They were using the scriptures to condemn her action. And Jesus said, He that's without sin, be the first one to hurl the rocks. And they went out. He said, where's your accuser? She said, nobody's accusing me. I don't accuse you. I don't condemn you. The unselfish love of Jesus the Holy Spirit 
guided application of the Word of God transforms us from a rock-throwing, condemning, toxic Bible believer into the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ on this earth. Jesus to Simon Peter, after Simon denied him three times very publicly during the whole event of the mock trial and the crucifixion, Simon Peter, who after Jesus rose from the dead, would go back to his old life as if he never knew who Jesus was, Jesus would come to him on that shore where the multitude of fish were caught. Jesus would use charity and love, unselfish love for Peter. And because of that, Holy Spirit guided application of the Word of God to Simon Peter in John 21, we find Peter on the day of Pentecost proclaiming the word of Jesus once more and thousands turning their heart and life to our Lord and Savior. You see, Peter moved into the third phase when he met Jesus on that shore that day. The Apostle Paul would be Saul breathing out threatenings against the church. Jesus would meet him on the road to Damascus. Why persecutest thou me? It's hard, the kicks that you're throwing out. You see, that unselfish love of Jesus would convert Saul the terrorizer into Paul the apostle of all good. Holy Spirit guided application of the truths that we know will move us into the supernatural realm of having a massive spiritual impact. Because the Bible will no longer be poison. The Bible will no longer be the letter that has killed. Rather, the Bible will become this blessed book the blessed guide, the one that the Holy Spirit has come and He teaches us all things that Jesus commanded us, the Bible will be the transformation of our life rather than the knowledge increaser of our head. I really believe that most everyone wants in their heart and life to help those they care about. If I were to ask you, do you want your sons and daughters to thrive? I don't believe a single one of you would go, no. I believe every one of you would say, if you ask me, do I want my children to thrive more than my own life? Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life. I would lay down my life for my children. I go, I know you believe that. Maybe the fact that we need to enter into this third arena is why we're not seeing the life happening. We're watching the acidic poison eat up everything around us because we need to enter into the realm where the Word of God is light and life and health and hope. You see, the thief came and he stole and he killed and he destroyed way too much of our life already. We're going to denounce the thief and we're going to go with Jesus Christ. He has given us his spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, whereby we can practice that unselfish love. So much is digitized that photography has taken on a different realm than it ever did before. But back in my day, all the photos were printed on paper. And if a boyfriend or girlfriend got together, they'd get a picture or two and that, that paper was so precious. But then, oh, Happens all the time, right? 
you know where I'm about to go, the couple breaks up. So, what do I do with this lovely picture? Get out the scissors. Chop, 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 chop. Take the image of the X, throw it away. If you're really angry, you take the image of the X and you throw it away by means of a fire. Burn that picture. Why? Because that image represents somebody that your heart has angst towards. Well, you know, as we, as we talk about transforming the Bible through our life, to move from being toxic to being precious, to move from being fatal to being healing, to move from being something people run from to something people are drawn to, as we make that move, we understand we must practice charity or unselfish love. The only way that we're going to practice unselfish love to our fellow man is when we roll back into the truth, that thorough working knowledge of the Word of God, and we go, in the image of God created He them. Male and female created He them. When I see that person, the person who disgusts me, they're still in the image of God. When I see that person who is attacking me, they're still in the image of God. When I see that person who rejects my message and defies my beliefs and is living a life destroying themselves that I don't approve of, that person is in the image of God. Everywhere you look, Whenever you see a human face, you're looking at another image of God. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. Romans says it's the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. If people could see the goodness of God through us, they too could be transformed, make that change of heart, that change of direction, that repentance toward God. But we will never have unselfish love for others until we see them as an image of God. When that angry ex girlfriend is putting his image in the fire, she's hating on him. But when we see those who Satan has destroyed their life with the fires of sin, and we love them, we're loving them in the place of God. Your face represents God. I love God so I can love His image. I thought of all the great things that have happened in my life. Maybe you've gotten remarkable bonuses at time and again. Maybe you've come into large sums of money. But if you're honest, the money was nice, but non-transformative. I think about the project for our church right now, what we're working on. We're working to put together the assembly center where people can come and hear the Word of God. If all the money in the world were brought in and the assembly center was made of gold and lined in silver, oh, it'd be a lot nicer than any other church building. But it wouldn't be transformative. What's transformative is that the gospel of Jesus Christ can make people wise unto salvation. 
and their life can be transformed. Can you remember the day when your life was transformed by calling on the name of Jesus Christ? Then, of course, as we grew in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, there was more and more transformation with every line. Oh, people give decent statements and wise quotes that are helpful to a point, but then later they're proven wrong, or there's exceptions to every rule, they say. But not with God's eternal, forever settled in heaven, holy word. And as you grew in the knowledge of the Word of God, your understanding of all the things on the earth was totally transformed. Hey, the more I look at the Bible, the more I look at the end of the age approaching and how near to the end things are, and I go, the old saying, I've read the back of the book and we win is true, therefore I don't have to fear what's happening in our world. That knowledge of the Word of God is transformative. But it's toxic until I move into that third arena. And that is the Holy Spirit-guided application of the knowledge that I have from the Word of God. See, that moves me from hurting to helping from poison to precious, from that that people reject and denounce to that which they are drawn to and will receive. May your life be with God in all things because you're resting on all three, the salvation in Jesus Christ, the thorough knowledge of the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit-guided application of the truths of God. Just a couple closing thoughts as we wind in on today's teaching. I pray that this series, With God, in all of our things, has been a blessing to your heart. But rather than take that candle, that light from God's Word, and slide it under the bed, what if we put it up on the candlestick? Let me tell you what I mean by that. Would you be willing to copy the link of today's video and share it with a friend? Just copy the link in your browser and paste it in an outbound text, paste it in an outbound email, and share it with somebody else who you believe these words would be a blessing to their heart. I always encourage folks, go ahead and hit the like button. Subscribe so you know our other events are coming and other videos are being produced. And then, of course, to all of our faithful friends, I want to thank you for your financial support. By your giving at newlifebegins.com, you're helping us change the world. I pray that you'll take this clip and share it with somebody so the blessings God poured into your heart today can be sprinkled over their life as well. God bless you, my friend. Live in victory today.